To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous peoples of this area for their care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for joining our presentation today. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Seema Afsharnazad, who will be presenting on handheld microbiome sequencing to detect, identify, and monitor tick-borne pathogen. Dr. Afsharnazad is a member of the Claudi Lab at Queen's University. She is researching new techniques and informatic paradigms for identifying, quantifying, and characterizing the microbiome, as well as their changes in the ticks lab. The long-term goal is to make handheld sequencers viable and cost-effective tool to detect, monitor, and discover pathogens in a variety of field settings. Dr. Afsharnazad received her PhD in biochemistry from Tehran University in Iran, where she researched on molecular biology methods and bacteria-based nanoparticle production. In September 2020, she graduated from Queen's University with a graduate diploma in medical informatics. Beginning in January 2022, she has served as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Biology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. We will have Dr. Afshar Nazad present, and then we will open for questions from the audience. You can ask your questions by entering the chat box, you can raise your hand using your icon, or if time allows, you can unmute and ask your question directly. Please help us welcome Dr. Afshar Nazad to the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, is that fine? Yes, we can see it. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Sima. Today I'm going to talk about hand cell microbiome sequencing to detect, identify, and monitor tick-borne pathogens. Nowadays, the time is of critical importance for identifying pathogens, in particular in accurate disease. Everybody knows that uh, NGS technologies uh, perform a sequencing uh, properly and um, also, this technology is very good for do sequencing, but honestly, they are not designed for the rapid capture of sequence data. In some uh, condition, actually, we need to get our uh, sequence data very fast and um, obtain the, uh, our sequencing uh, data and uh, make a decision quickly. For that reason, having a handheld or um, portable uh, nanopore sequencing uh, is desired, um, required. We are also as a biologist, as a researcher in the field, or maybe a doctor at a um, hospital or clinics, in some hard situation actually uh, needs to have a portable um, handheld sequencing. And uh, having the, this uh, sort of um, device will be so helpful and practical in some condition. For that reason, in our lab, we have a mean ion. Mean ion is a hands or portable real-time sequencing. And as a part of our TICS project, actually, we decided to uh, set up and develop its pipeline and also uh, set up its um, making library. And today, I'm going to show you how we can get a valuable result with this uh, new technology. In terms of ticks, as you know, ticks has two types, uh, soft and hard, but the only hard one can transmit Lyme disease. So in our project, we only focus on the hard ticks. We have different uh, species for hard ticks, and, uh, but the black leg ticks is much more common in Ontario and cause uh, Lyme disease and work as a vector of this disease. So in our project, again, we only focus on the black leg ticks. A black leg ticks or deer ticks or exodus families has four life cycles, eggs, nympha, larva, nympha, and adults. And as you can see in the figure, each of them has its own host. And of course, we have a different uh, community bacteria. And among of them, actually nymph has a more common um, 
bacteria and can transmit uh, Lyme disease uh, more than the others. We have different uh, ticks species, and it's a very important factor as a risk factor of Lyme disease, like Exodus, Ambiloma, Dermocanter, and uh, Pipicephalus. And each of them, as you can see, we can carry different pathogens. For example, Dermocanter and Exodus are more common in Ontario, and Exodus only is able to transmit and carry on the Borrelia family as a Actually, it is a bacteria um, that we, we were looking for that. And also this um, exotism is able to carry on uh, Erlika, Hausen, uh, Francisella, and Bartolena. And the same as uh, Derma Center, uh, actually it can uh, carry on with of Francisella and Babicella as well. But in our project, we focus on the exotism families. The discovery of the, the history of discovery Borrelia burgdorferi as a risk factor of the Lyme disease and uh, the role of the exodus family as a vector of this bacteria, honestly, is not very new. It backs to 1970. But the problem is that we are in 2020 and we are still stuck with the detection of tick-borne pathogens mainly Borrelia um, pathogen bacteria in our samples. For example, in a study in Europe, they work in a more than 100 patients with the Lyme disease symptom, but they couldn't detect the tick-borne pathogen, in particular uh, Borrelia uh, burgdorferi in their sample using the qPCR. So it seems that we have a still many challenges in Lyme disease. We have uh, still challenges in symptoms. Um, you know that um, the Lyme disease has overlapped, the symptom of Lyme disease has overlapped with the other disease. Or uh, our diagnostic test, our routine diagnostic test, actually, we are, um, it appears that we have uh, still uh, challenges because um, some routine diagnostic tests like, um, serological assay, like um, simple uh, targeted PCR. Uh, it's obvious, obvious that they are not, uh, they have not uh, enough uh, accuracy. So we need to uh, move to more accurate um, techniques like advanced molecular techniques. And I'm gonna today talk about this part as well. And also there is an overlap between the other bacteria and pathogen. And today I'm gonna show you how a bacteria with high abundance can affect to detection of the Borrelia. And uh, the last aspect of the challenges is anything else like genetic variants, like ecological features. And actually we don't know uh, why we have more prevalence Lyme disease in some part of the world compared to the other part. So we need to do more research in this field. In terms of the advanced molecular techniques for microbiome analyzing uh, in Lyme disease, we do offer two techniques, 16S or RNA gene profiling and shotgun metagenomics. Both of the techniques start with extraction of the DNA from a community of bacteria. And after getting the amplification, the genome, Finally, we can uh, get the taxonomic profiling and we can figure out that how many bacteria or how many microbiome and uh, which microbiome or what bacteria are there in our community um, microbiome. But it, each of the, each technique has uh, its own uh, advantages. For example, for shotgun metagenomics, we can get more information about the virus, fungi, and also about the functional analysis. But 16S or RNA has more coverage for bacteria detection and also more accurate. So for that reason, in our study, we first focus on the 16S or RNA. What is 16S or RNA? This is a small ribosomal prokaryote RNA. It has some uh, variable and conceived region. And uh, as you can see, we have um, 
B1 to B9 conserve region, and we use this region to design a primer and uh, amplify this part of genome of uh, 16S rRNA. It depends on our purpose. If you wanted to sequence partial of the 16S rRNA, we usually put the primer and we wanted to uh, amplifying this part. I mean that we want to maximum V4 or in some study I saw V6 as well. But if you want to do uh, get information in whole 60s or uh, 6s or RNA and sequence all of the, this part, mean ion one of the best uh, option in this field. For sequence of the 16 R RNA, of course, we have different methods. For example, we have a, a Singer, the older one. And we have the second generation. In this part, we have uh, Illumina sequencing, like MySeq and HiSeq. And with Illumina sequencing, we have a chance to get lots of data. But the problem is that we just need, we can get a very short risk, as you can see, less than about 500 to 400 base pair. But uh, the third generation, we have a mean ion and PAC bio RS. And with mean ion, as you can see, we are able to detect a very long risk, more than 8,000 to month, much more than 10 kilobase per reads. And also, this is the real time sequencing. Uh, mean ion uh, sequencing belongs to Oxford Nanocore Technology. Uh, this technology has a different platform, phalange, mean ion, grid ion, and promptly ion. And only phalange and mean ion, both of them are hand cell uh, sequencing. And in our lab, actually, we have a mean ion, and all of the data I'm going to show you be generated from this device. Uh, this technology, I mean that Oxford Nanocore technology uh, offered, uh, um, is able to do direct DNA and RNA sequencing. It is a real, real time. And also, as I told you before, we, it is able to detect ultra long reads up to two uh, megabytes. The basic of the mean ion is that, as you can see the bottom of the picture, we have a fellow cell, each fellow cell, um, is usually covered with many uh, channel protein. And this channel protein work as a sensor. And uh, after that, DNA can go through this channel. DNA can be sequenced uh, during the movement, uh, during the channel, and we will have a real-time sequencing. And it depends on the which base of the DNA is located in the pool. Uh, we have different ionic um, um, current changes. And after the, um, the process, the, uh, the signal processing with the, some um, algorithm, we can convert the, this signal, ionic signal, to the uh, fast file and get the information of the R sequence. The advantage of the mean ion for our team was that the first thing we were able to detect the, and generate a long read data. So we guess maybe we can get a more information and we can get a more uh, detect more uh, bacteria. The other advantages, uh, this technology offers real time analyzing and it's very good for rapid insight. That exactly we were looking for that. And the last one but not least, this technology is work uh, for low quality DNA sample. It's very important, especially when you are working on environmental sample, and also we work on the uh, nymph and male uh, ticks and the quality of the DNA and the amount of the DNA was very low and we couldn't get any good results with Illumina. So mean ion would be the best option when you have a low quality DNA samples. About the bioinformatics, uh, actually, in my opinion, it is one of the most challenging parts for mean ion because this technology is very new and there is a, a few pipeline for mean ion. Uh, in our uh, study for the first one, for our six data, we decided to uh, use and modify and develop the nanoclass. Uh, this pipeline actually starts with 
uh, with the uh, FASTQ file, but before the FASTQ file, as I told you, the output of the mean ion is the uh, ionic signal, and during the base column with some algorithm, uh, we usually convert the um, signal to FASTQ file and then um, input the FASTQ file as the input in the nano class. This pipeline, uh, the first step of the, this pipeline is um, demultiplex process, the same as the other pipeline in short read sequencing like data two or shimi. Um, during the demultiplex, we usually remove the adapter, primer, any duplication or chimera. And after the quality control, the basic of the nanoclass is based of the clustering. The algorithm they use for clustering is UMAP, and for the visualization, uh, it uses the uh, HTTP scan. After the clustering the data, um, we have a polishing uh, a step. During the polishing, we have the, some algorithm to polish the data and generate the uh, consensus FASTA file. And finally, each consensus file file will be blast and we can figure out that which bacteria and how many bacteria are there in our samples. Our team are uh, indisciplinary teams. We, are, uh, we have uh, been working on uh, development the nanoclass. For example, some of our uh, colleagues work on the clustering algorithm and could increase the um, accuracy of UMAP from 82% uh, to more than 97% in this pipeline. The other team actually we are working to how we can integrate it, the downstream analyzing from the other pipeline like data to our Shimi to nanoclass. And I'm going, to, I'm going to show you some of the, our results today. And also about the blast, we are going to to also um, use the other uh, database, actually nanoclast for producing uh, the uh, taxonomy profiling use the NCBI. And we just writing a very simple API, we can get uh, more information from the other database like uh, Silva or Green um, Genes. And we are hoping to compare the accuracy of the database in future. Given this introduction, it seems that the 16SR RNA has a good potential for detection of the tick-borne pathogen TBP, especially uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. But the problem was that when we started studying the 16SR RNA in our tick sample, uh, we had a problem in whole ticks. Uh, one of our, uh, our colleagues, Dr. Paulson, in our team found that um, when we work on whole, uh, whole ticks, when we have a lot of Rickettsia, Buchner in our sample, the, we cannot detect the Borrelia families or the rate of the Borrelia families is very low, as you can see. However, she could find many Borrelia family in guts and in salivary gland. And as uh, because we wanted to, we wanted to work on the whole tick, so um, it would be so difficult. And also uh, we found that the percentage of the rictesia in our samples uh, is very, uh, was very high. We, we, want, uh, we found that uh, more than 90% uh, rictesia percentage in our sample. And also we found in some samples 100% rictesia bone differing. So how can to fix it, this big issue? The first, uh, a strategy for us was that using a targeted enrichment sequencing. Targeted gene in our um, test was Borrelia burgdorferi, the pathogen that we were looking for that. The other strategy is that removal non-targeted sequencing. Non-targeted uh, gene in our samples was uh, Rickettsia buchneri. About the enrichment targeted sequencing, for nanopore sequencing or mean ion, one of the best option is adaptive sampling. Mean ion has recently added this option and it's very easy. You just need to upload the sequence of the, um, your target channel. For example, you just need to upload the sequence of the bacteria, uh, Borrelia families. And then mean ion uh, will sequence only uh, Borrelia's family and one group, um, could detect the Borrelia 
Borgoferi, Borrelia, Myomatii, Anaplasma, and Erica successfully with this method. The other method for enrichment is that during the making and preparation the library, you can uh, select the, your target gene. For example, by create a very specific primer for your Borrelia's family and uh, conjugate this uh, primer with biotin, abedine, and streptoabedine. And after the magnetic separation during the uh, amplification, after that, finally, you will have only uh, amplified um, Borrelia's genome. And uh, mean ion can sequence only Borrelia's uh, or your target genome. This is the, also this uh, good strategy, both of them, uh, I mean that, um, before sequencing or during the making um, construction your library, both of them work properly. But the problem is that we will lose this chance to detect the other pathogen. And as our uh, study was a pilot, a pilot study, and we wanted to know which bacteria are there in our samples, so we decided to choose the second strategy. I mean that remove the non-targeted gene. Uh, for removing non-targeted gene in our samples, of course, non-targeted gene is, uh, was uh, Rickettsia bunkeri. Uh, the easiest way was that using the restriction enzyme. But the problem is that the restriction enzyme, for using the restriction enzyme, we need to have access and have information about the unique cotton site. And for the Borrelia's family, it was impossible and so difficult. So we decided to use the another strategy and using the blocking primer and block the Rickettsia genome instead. Um, like using the blocking primer, to be honest, is not a very new technology, new techniques. Uh, we usually this uh, blocking uh, primer for the block the uh, genome of the mitochondria or chloroplasma is very common. And uh, we decided to use exactly the same strategy for the blocking the Rickettsia genome. For the blocking primer, uh, we can use the um, simple oligonucleotide or we can use the, some chemical substance like PPO or many, many other actually uh, materials. You can find it in uh, the other researchers. And the mechanism of the blocking primer, we have different mechanism. For example, in our research, we decided to choose the annealing inhibiting blocking oligo and elongation arrest blocking oligo. For annealing inhibiting, uh, inhibiting blocking oligo, you just need to design your blocking primer that has an overlap between the, uh, your um, universal primer and also your uh, non-target genome. And for the elongation arrest, you just need to put your blocking primer between two um, universal primer. Let me um, talk about it in detail in our design. We had uh, designed five types of blocking primer. The first one, as you can see in the bottom, we decided to block all of the Rickettsia family. Blocking primer one and 1492 block primer, both of them, the mechanism of the uh, annealing inhibiting, because the, as you can see, the purple arrow is the our universal sickness or RNA primer, and both of them has an overlap between our universal problem um, primer and also Rickettsia genome. Blocking primer two works as an elongation and because we put this blocking primer between two universal primer and this primer can stop, can suppress the elongation step. And also we use the DPO uh, and DPO exactly the same as blocking primer one effect on the annealing of our primers. To validation our blocking primers and figure out that how is the efficiency of blocking primer. We had three uh, ways. Um, the first one, we could do the qPCR and getting uh, melting curve analyzing. Uh, so especially it's very good for the, when you have a, um, your blocking primer, the mechanism is the um, annealing inhibiting. 
uh, or maybe uh, with the um, gel electrophoresis, you can use the DNA fragments or the another technology, NGS, and of course, NGS much more accurate than the other ones. Uh, so uh, for detection of the uh, efficiency of our blocking primer, we decided to use the NGS method. In this part, we were looking to answer three questions. The first one, what type of blocking primers has the most efficiency? To answer this question, we work on a 10 pooled female tick sample, and the result for one of the our blocking primer was so interesting. As you can see, blocking primer one could block Rictestia amplification of Rictestia genome about 98%. And also for blocking primer two and DPO, we found about 50% inhibition. And for the 1492 blocking primers, we only find that about 15% um, inhibition or blocking with SEO genome. And also in our sample, as you can see, we try to check the two enzyme, two different enzyme, Pragobio and Kyogen, although Kyogen we, can, we could get a better result, but there isn't any significance between the two enzymes. As a result, uh, blocking primer one works perfectly and we could block the Rictesia bunkeri or Rictesia, all of the Rictesia family properly. And also in our um, pipeline, as I told you, our pipeline is based on the clustering method, the same as Shimi. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, when we didn't use any blocking primer, we will have a lot of rickettsia. And as you can see, we can only get a nine clusters. But after the using the blocking primer um, and remove the rickettsia uh, from our samples, we could get a 26 cluster and it helps to uh, have an accurate uh, clustering in our um, pipeline. The second question, how are bacterial communities in blocking primers different? Uh, as you can see, for the blocking primer one, uh, as expected, we can we could get a better result, and we could uh, this blocking primer could detect the um, most of the families bacteria in our samples compared to without any blocking primer. For any blocking primer, because we had lots of rickettsia in our samples. The only uh, this blocking primer can detect only two families bacteria. And also, as you can see, for 40, 92 blocking primer, we could get a few uh, families bacteria. And for DPO and blocking primer too, it worked a little bit at the same. And uh, we can uh, we could get a half of the families bacteria com compared to blocking primer one. And again, this blocking primer one, uh, we have more chance to get more bacteria. All of the all of the our blocking primers can detect the eight families, as you can see, like Pesadomonase, Rictesiase, Estafilase, and the, and so on. The last question is was that is there any difference between using blocking primer and using bioinformatics to remove Rictesia? Maybe you ask yourself why we need to design and use the blocking primer. We can uh, remove and exclude the percentage of the rickettsia and uh, normalize data up to 100, the same as many research actually researchers do with this method. But to answer this question, you consider that we had two problems. One, we had some samples with the rickettsia more than 90-90% or 100%. The other one, we checked the, this strategy and we found that when we remove the rickettsia mathematically or um, manually in our sample, uh, compared to when you use the blocking primer, as you can see, when we use the blocking primer, we had more chance to detect the bacteria. The white um, boxes, in the, it means that this um, method can't, uh, couldn't detect any um, order or family in our samples. And uh, for both of them, I mean that order and families, we found that the, using the blocking primer, it would be better a strategy that they um, remove the rickettsia manually in our samples. 
So we decided to use the Belakin primer one and in our sample and remove the Rickettsia and see that uh, is there any chance to get more Borrelia in our samples or not. To check the repeatability and reliability of the blocking primer one, we decided to check the blocking primer one on more samples. Six, uh, we collected our um, six sample uh, around the uh, Kingston area, and we work on the 81 individual exotic escapularus. And we found that uh, with the mean ion sequencing technique, we found 11 phyla, 65 order, 809 family bacteria, 212 gena, and finally 364 species. The same as the other studies, actually, we also find that propiobacteria, actinobacteria, and firmicutes are more common in phyla. And also in terms of the families, we found that the Propino, Bacteriaceae, and also the other, for example, Pesodomonaceae uh, um, are more common uh, families. In our sample, we had lots of Ralstonia, Pesodomonas, and lots of Staphylococcus, and the Cornibacter was the most uh, dominant in our samples. We couldn't find any Anaplasma and Erica, however, Borrelia, Francisella, and Rickettsia were detected. Interestingly, we found many Legionella species and lots of Staphylococcus epidermis in our samples. About the efficiency of the Belakin primer one, as you can see, the result again was so interesting. We find that when you use the Belakin primer compared to some samples, the same sample without any Belakin primer, we have more chance to detect the Borrelia burgoferi. When we use the, without using a Belakin primer, as you can see, in only one sample, uh, we could detect the Borrelia burgoferi. This sample had 98% Rictesia burgoferi, and the percentage of the Rictesia um, Borrelia burgoferi uh, sorry, Borrelia burgoferi was only 0.03 percentage. However, when we use the blocking primer, we can get a more Borrelia burgoferi as well. In general, uh, we had uh, 65 female pigs and 16 male pigs, and we found 38% Borrelia in our samples. After that, for us, uh, what's very important to know that what is coloration between the Borrelia and Rickettsia? Although we could um, suppress and block the Rickettsia families, but in 89 samples, we found five individual six Rickettsia say, and in three ticks, collect uh, Costiella say, families. So uh, we decided to check the coloration between the Rickettsia and Borrelia in 81 sample. The best way for us uh, was that we couldn't get any coloration or at least negative coloration because we wanted to show that if we remove the Rickettsia percentage in our sample, it has a less effect on the Borrelia percentage. And again, good news, we got a negative coloration between the Borrelia and Rickettsia in our sample. Um, we performed a very simple network analyzing on our data. Um, the network coherence analyzing, the purpose of the network analyzing is that we are looking to figure out and finding any potential relationship between bacteria. And at the general, uh, general uh, level, we found that there is a strong association between the Borrelia and Francisella, and also there is an association between the Borrelia, uh, Pesedomonas, Staph, and also Legionna and Stereobacteria. But more accurate at the families level, we found the uh, association between the Borrelia's family and Francisella family and Propiona uh, bacteria family and also uh, the Pesodomonas family. But the question is that, is there any positive or negative coloration between this association? For answer this question, we perform a spark analyzing to figure out that the 
uh, a relation existing between bacteria and this relation is positive or negative. Uh, as you can see, the result shows that uh, for Borrell, between Borrelia and Francisella and also Enterobacter, we found a positive coloration. However, between the Pesodomonas, Staph, and also as expected Rictesia families, we found a negative coloration. And only between Francisella, Pesodomonas, and Enterobacter with the Borrelia, we found a significant thing. When we say that, okay, between these two bacteria, there is a positive coloration or there is a negative, it means that when two bacteria, for example, between the um, Borrelia and Francisella or Enterobacter, there is a positive coloration, it means that maybe, maybe they, these two bacteria uh, has um, similar host or has similar functionality in pig body. And when we say that, okay, between the Borrelia and staph or Pesodomonas on Rickettsia has a negative coloration, it means that maybe between these two bacteria, uh, they are competent. And our hypothesis that, especially between Borrelia and Rickettsia, we found a negative coloration, maybe these two bacteria and also in uh, staph or Pesodomonas are competing. To answer this question, why they need to know about the association between bacteria or correlation is positive or negative and so on. Uh, what is important? To answer this question, I would like to say for two reasons. The first step to figure out that the mechanism of the bacteria in ticks and just give an idea for the treatment in future. For example, in a study, actually, they showed that some skin animal or human pathogens like Staphylococcus epidermis, we have lots of Staphylococcus epidermis in our sample, or Corninobacter or Bacillus subitilis, they can induce the immunosystem in ticks body. And after that, bitter from gamma can uh, will be released and induce the SAT pathway, resulting in we have a um, DAE2 in the tick gut epithelium. This is the antibiotic protein. This protein um, will, will be released and uh, the resulting in that Borrelia burgdorferi uh, has to escape from the gut to salivary gland and then out of the uh, tick's body and the ticks can uh, transmit Lyme disease. So just thinking if we can for any treatment, uh, we can suppress the stuff, for example, epidermis and ticks, we can keep the Borrelia burgdorferi inside the ticks body and prevent the transmission of the Lyme disease, just as a hypothesis. Or the other uh, reason for, find, for finding that um, better understanding co-infections. Nowadays, for chronic Lyme disease, we, we, saw the, we see the um, many co-infections. I mean, that maybe a tick is able to transfer and carry on more than one um, tick-born uh, pathogen. So, for example, in our sample, we found the, a strong association between Francisella and Borrelia. Maybe, uh, we, maybe in future we can find that, okay, Francisella and Borrelia would be the, um, this choice to, um, to and can cause co-infection. So uh, in terms of the Rickettsia in our sample also, um, as I told you in the first slides, uh, the exotic family uh, can carry on some pathogens, for example, like Rickettsia, Francisella family, and Coxiella family, and also we found all of the these families in our samples. And uh, in terms of the um, correlation between the Rickettsia and also Borrelia, actually there are uh, there is lots of debate. Some researchers uh, said that uh, there is a negative coloration, the same as our research, and maybe these two pathogens. Uh, are uh, competent, but some researchers said that no, there is a positive correlation between Borrelia and Rickettsia. 
Uh, I think uh, actually there is a ecological and a geological pattern for the coloration between the Borrelia and Rickettsia, and we need more do more research in this field. At the end, we decided to blast some of the, our pathogen in our samples. Uh, for example, uh, for Borrelia burgoferi, uh, in NCBI, we found that uh, more than 90-19% coverage with the mean ion uh, technique and 95% uh, identify accuracy. For Rickettsia, Rifecephaly, we found that 97% uh, coverage and 97.96% percent uh, identify accuracy for uh, diploricetia as well we found the 91 percent coverage and finally for Francisca uh, Francisca Persikov we found 97 uh, coverage and uh, 95 percent um, identity um, accuracy for the next step we are thinking and we are going to complete uh, and develop the nanopore um, sequencing pipeline. Uh, we are going to finish the phylogenic analyzing and do community member analyzing as well. And the second part is very important to compare our mean ion sequence data and result with the illumina sequencing at the same um, uh, samples. And finally, for future, we are hoping to introduce a rapid test based on the hand cell sequencing um, in the future. And the four, five, by five, or maybe 10, nobody knows, maybe in my opinion sooner, we will have a, a Smith ion. Actually, nanopore sequencing and the Apple company is developing a very tiny sequencer. And uh, this sequencer can be connected to your cell phone and you can uh, do sequencing anytime, anywhere, and anything. And uh, get your result of your sequencing in a maximum 10 minutes. That's so, so interesting. And uh, in my opinion, as we are living in an era, um, we need to be prepared ourselves for the new and modern technologies and figure out that what is advantages and disadvantages and how to fix it. So for that reason, it would be awesome. Our team uh, have a good collaboration with the Public Health Ontario and Kingston Health Science Centers. We have recently set up a high throughput sequencing for detection and tracking, tracking COVID-19. And uh, we are hoping exactly the same method because the high throughput sequencing we performed with the using a mean ion sequencing. So we are hoping exactly set up this method for Lyme disease patients in future. And also in our team, uh, we are working on the ecological events and sociological events. And we are as a molecular biology team, we are working on this figure out that some pipeline of the molecular biological event and finding any overlap between each event and uh, figure out that each of them can affect on the Lyme disease and how to control, how to can introduce a, a risk model for a Lyme disease and so on. And for getting more information about our research, we do recommend to visit our website, mylyme.ca. And then thank you very much for your listening. And I just want to thank you for uh, Cloti Lab at Queen's University Center for Advanced Computing. And on top of that, I really thank you for Canadian Lyme disease to give me this opportunity to share our team result to you. And the last one, I really thank you, my supervisor, Dr. Cloti Lab, my colleagues, Elmira, Damon, Logan, Jinsing, and Lori. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Afshar Nazad, for your presentation today. Uh, we're going to move to questions and answers. Uh, if anybody has a question for Dr. Afshar Nazad, uh, please go ahead. Oh, I see one. It just says here, Mir. Uh, go ahead and unmic and ask your question. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, you nicely introduced this modern and emerging technology. And its applications. 
my question is what the cost per sample would be comparing to the traditional method? Actually, about the price, um, um, it's a little bit difficult. Actually, because uh, the you mean that the nanopore sequencing compared to Illumina? Yes. Uh, for nanopore sequencing, uh, because we already set up these techniques in our lab, and uh, as a person who ordered the materials for Illumina and nanopore at the same time for TIX project, I think. Um, Maybe I'm not sure. Maybe less than five. Uh, maybe Dr. Kolodi uh, actually can help me to answer this question. Um, I just say that for the, um, in my opinion, it would be less than five dollar. But I, I I don't like to exactly the same uh, price because honestly, um, I'm not sure about that. But it is definitely cheaper than uh, the um, Illumina. Why? Because uh, for mean ion, we use the, um, we have um, fellow cell and also barcode in kit. For fellow cell, it is usable. And the barcode in uh, kits, we can um, use the bar each barcode in kit for more than um, 12 times on 96 samples. I think it would be cheaper than, uh, but for the analyzing the data, because I worked in both of the Methods definitely mean ion or nanopore sequencing is much more faster. For example, for producing the data from mean ion for 96 for 81 sample, it would be about uh, 20 or maximum 40 hours. And the analyzing the data with uh, our modified nano class, we can get the result of the how many bacteria and which bacteria are there in our sample only 15 minutes. Uh, for the pipeline and analyzing the data, pretty sure the um, compared to Illumina, the nanopore sequencing, we can get a more faster result. Yes. Maybe I'll just jump in. Um, <clears throat> as as Seema was kind of alluding to, there's not a simple answer to that question. It really depends on if you're talking about a one-off sample, that's much more expensive than if you're talking about a pooled sample. Um, and, you know, are we, are we comparing to Illumina or are we comparing to uh, like a targeted PCR assay? <clears throat> so it's, it's definitely more expensive than a targeted PCR, but it's, it's comparable with Illumina. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, we still have time for additional questions. If anyone from the audience has a question, uh, please raise your hand icon or unmute and ask your question for Dr. Afshar Nazad. We have quiet audience today. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll give it one more call out. Uh, don't be shy if you have any questions, she's here to answer them for you. Okay, well, maybe um, what I'm gonna do is unshare your presentation and just uh, share my screen and maybe additional question will pop up while I give them an update of our wrapping up of Lyme Disease Awareness Month and maybe we'll see another question pop up. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Afsharnazad for her presentation today, um, but we are still have two more presentations uh, when we wrap up our uh, topics for this month. So next week uh, on Monday, May 30th at 12 p.m. noon Eastern Standard Time, we have Dr. Clara Jondo Prats and Dr. Janet Parson who are presenting, co-presenting on co-creating a dialogue with patients, families, and other stakeholders concerning Lyme disease. And then our Lyme Disease Awareness Month wraps up on Tuesday, May 31st at noon. Uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Darling and Sue Faber from Lyme Hope, who will be presenting on Lyme disease and pregnancy, the value of research partnerships. 
Um, so hopefully you can join us uh, next week. Also a reminder, our uh, Lyme disease challenge is still ongoing to the end of the month. Wear green or wear a green face mask, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness for Lyme disease. Um, you can submit your photos to Clydern at gmail.com and all entries received before May 31st will be automatically entered into a draw of one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. If you don't like to have your photo taken, and I'm one of those people, you can do an artistic drawing or a creative pottery or anything that represents Lyme awareness of the uh, month for you. Take a photo of of that artwork and send it in and you will also be entered into the draw. Um, I'm just quickly looking in the chat box. I'm going to stop sharing. No more hands. So that is it today, Dr. F. Sharnazad. I do want to thank you again uh, for presenting today um, and thank everybody for joining us and staying on the call and hope to catch you next week. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. I'm just going to stop the recording. Thank you. Have a